The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. The uh, presentation on uh, uh, well, spam, the enemy within is the title of the slide. And spam egg sausage and spam is the title that they put in the uh, um, bolt. And if we have some Vikings here, we could, uh, I could lead you all in a song. None? None? Not enough me. Spam, 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 spam. Okay. All right. Um, there's my little... Uh, 1997 era website, um, Rob Zero dot No DNS for us. I do uh, try to do <laughs> uh, uh, mail and uh, DNS consulting and uh, various things. Set up VPNs, whatever people need. I do Linux geek work when I can find it. And uh, I am the postmaster for the uh, Slackbuilds.org um, organization. Um, and uh, run the mail server there, which is kind of small, but, uh, but small enough to be able to uh, learn more than I ever wanted to learn about spam. Um, and what we are dealing with uh, in the threats. Now, I, I should go to the next slide here. That's a page down, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. The, um, it helps to know who spammers are. Um, do we have any, uh, before we go on, or, uh, I talked to at least a couple of you here. Are any of you run your own mail server? Awesome, good deal. Then this might be a partial interest to you. Were any of you uh, foolish enough, <coughs> I mean fortunate enough to catch my presentation last year? No, no, good. Well, I, I don't know if anybody survived it. I think I put them all to sleep. Um, all right, uh, the uh, Spam House Project maintains a register of known spam operations called ROXO. Um, and these are the unrepentant, the hardcore uh, spammers of the world. Um, this, I, I haven't checked recently, but um, at least as of last year, they said, and I'm pretty sure it's about the same number. They said 100 known spam operations are responsible for 80% of the spam in the world. In the world. There's a tiny number of people are wrecking the internet for all of us. Um, for many people, email is just unusable because of this garbage. Um, they figure that each of these uh, spam gangs, they call them, typically consist of one to five people. So you've got approximately 300 to 400 in the world that do this. So if you think you've ever seen a spammer in person, chances are you have not. Let's move on. I had uh, two whole days to prepare for uh, putting off my last minute preparations and I managed to succeed at that. So I haven't really been over this since um, last year. Um, okay, now spammers, what they do, they evolve in their tactics to, or their strategies to get into our mailboxes. Um, and it's a cycle as, as the slide shows. The spammers start spamming Mail administrators and end users identify that as a source of spam. The spammer adapts to how we manage to avoid them, and it just goes on. Then we have to change our strategies, and that's what this is about, the changing strategies. In the recent past, and still to a large extent, um, these are what spammers were using, These, this set of tools here. They've got botnets of 
malware or ratware, Microsoft Windows machines, you know, might as well say it, that's what it is. It's Windows. Um, they, uh, they get infected in various attack vectors, and uh, usually from um, um, less savvy users. They do use free mail accounts to some extent. This is not as, as big. The botnets are their main vector. I believe um, the last credible um, estimate I saw was that something like 90 some percent of spam is coming from botnets. Um, what we're going to get to here is how the botnets are evolving. Anyway, they've got the free mail accounts. They can sign up for, they have uh, software that has learned how to sign up for uh, Yahoo, Hotmail, Gmail accounts and they get them in bulk. Some of them will actually offer those accounts for sale uh, to other spammers when they, in their uh, back channel uh, forums. Uh, some spammers run their own uh, mail services. This is the, the can spam people. They, uh, they actually, uh, uh, these are the ones that are easiest to block because we, we can identify where they're coming from. Almost all, the rule of thumb is if spam comes from an IP address, only spam comes from that IP address. Um, there has been known that um, spammers are using cheap and unpaid labor uh, in the third world and uh, via online games that are, are solving uh, uh, CAPTCHA. Now this stupid thing come up here. Okay, that worked. <sighs> okay, I need F5 again. And paint. Um, I don't know. All right. Hey, there we go. That's that's the right one, isn't it? Yep. Okay. Um, this. Is, is about the spam networks, and as I said, uh, direct sending is, is not as common anymore. It's probably under 10% of all the spam you're going to see. And um, the, uh, what I call the you can spam law in the USA, tried to, um, it was a, a law bought and paid for by email marketers that tried to uh, specify certain ways in which um, theft and trespass can be legal. Go figure. I don't know. I mean, I have not given these people permission to use my mail server, but they say it's legal. To be legal, they have to provide unsubscribe links in the spam. They have to provide a real sender address for the spammer instead of that it's coming from David's address at hotmail.com. <laughs> it's got to have a real sender address that, uh, that they can monitor. And it has to have other contact information like telephone and uh, postal mail. If they meet those requirements, then they can use harvested list and uh, commit tr criminal trespass without somehow being guilty of that. I don't know how. Not the lawyer. Um, there are um, pink or what we call gray hat spammers who um, they, they, may, they have websites where people can sign up for uh, their marketing or possibly email of interest in some way. Um, like I know I had a user who signed up for some. Uh, religious uh, 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 emails and um, 
what these people do is um, they try to keep their list clean, but they, they're not really doing it right. Um, the only real way to maintain a mailing list is to confirm the address. The person submits their contact information to you um, as, the, as the sender. You send a confirmation mail to that address and nothing else. Nothing. Um, the pink spammers will actually subscribe you to the list with just the web form. This is not unusual. The problem with dealing with them is that some people actually do subscribe to that, like I said, my user with the uh, religious emails. Um, sometimes they're going to get harvested addresses. Sometimes they're going to get hostile people entering addresses that don't belong. Uh, but what they do when they get complaints is they try to remove those, what we call list washing. Um, snowshoe spam is a, um, a thing where uh, spammers have a large net block. This is getting much more difficult for them. That's what I said last year, and it's even more difficult now that we've run out of IPv4 air, uh, network space. But um, what they try to do is get a large net block and spread out the sending over various IP addresses in that um, network. I see these people on IRC all the time, and it's, uh, it's frustrating. Now, of course, they insist they're not spammers, but they probably are. Um, these networks are harder to be uh, detected by the uh, DNS block list that we rely on, like I mentioned Spam House earlier. And uh, they're going to use, if they use, a, a, I, I say well camouflaged, meaning if the reverse DNS um, pointers of that net block look respectable, then it's hard to identify and the, they're not going to get listed and these people are likely to end up in your mailbox. But like I said, it's getting more expensive to have those large net blocks and um, it's not working as well for them as it had in the past. They're moving away from this. Briefly, we're going to touch on the free mail accounts here, the accounts that were created to be used for spam. Um, a lot of times the, uh, an account will just be used for a single spam run. They can pump in a, um, a mailing list to that account. Um, it's going to take a while for the, for the free mail provider to detect it. Oh, hey, we're being, we're sending spam here. Um, and when they do detect it, well, they're going to lock out the account and, and then that spam run ends. Doesn't matter. They're going to just continue on the next account and keep, uh, keep on doing the same thing. The um, more, what we're seeing now though are the accounts with stolen credentials. Um, we've had, uh, I run, I'm a, one of the co-administrators of a uh, a spam mailing list called spammers.don'tlike.us and uh, we've even had them um, I accidentally approved one as moderator when when it came in it was from a, a, a colleague of mine in the UK and I recognized his name and I thought well that can't be we should have had him unmoderated so I just didn't even read what was there and clicked send and and I spammed people all over the world on a spam mailing list. <laughs> but it, it actually set off an interesting discussion and he did not realize, I believe it was a Gmail account. This guy is a, a .ed.uk, a very savvy user. He's not your typical person. We never did figure out how his account got hijacked, but it did. 
when they do get into somebody's account, what are they going to find there? They're going to find addresses of everyone you've sent mail to. You don't suppose they're going to use that? Of course they will. Um, recipients may have whitelisted the sender address. Sender addresses in email are not safe for whitelisting. The thing is, you, anyone, can send mail as any email address. You can set up your client to do that. That's getting more difficult with things like SPF and DKIM, and, and um, if you don't know what these are, that's Sender Policy Framework, which I'm not much of a believer in, so that's why it took me a while. Domain Keys Identified Mail, which was Yahoo's um, uh, standard, which is uh, more worthwhile but does the same thing. Um, so it's getting more difficult to do that, but a lot of times you're going to see a sender address that isn't that sender. In fact, that's the case with most spam. Okay, we um, now into the botnets. This is, as I said, this is the big um, uh, tool that they're relying on the most, and it's evolving. But they are Microsoft Windows machines with one of two basic types of malware. I said ratware. Uh, that's a little maze I put on there, so I thought that looked appropriate when I slapped that together last year. The first kind, and this is waning, the direct to MX sending. That is where a, a spam bot looks up the mail exchanger address for their uh, victim list and they connect directly to port 25 on the MX uh, host. Well, a lot of these Windows machines are at uh, um, end user um, IP address. They're, they're at um, um, dynamic um, ISPs and they're in many cases the port 25 is being blocked by, by a lot of ISPs. I don't know exactly how many. I believe Comcast does now. AT&T. Um, my own little ISP does uh, at home. You can't get out on port 25 from most home connections anymore. I don't, is that something you all are familiar with, or any of you? Yeah. Bell South, Bell South right. Mm -hmm. Charter, pretty sure Verizon does it too. Yeah, Verizon does too. Charter does it on the residential. Charter on the residential, yeah. Some of them will unblock you on port 25 if you have a reason to ask, but generally you've got to have a business class um, internet connection to do that. And if you have a business class connection, you're going to get custom reverse DNS set. And, and um, you have, other than that, they just say you don't have reason to be sending mail. Yeah. Charter says it's a violation of, of uh, terms of services to run a server at your house, which, you know, I have opinions on that. But, uh, I mean, you're, you're not doing much different with a mail server at your home than you are doing with. Um, Thunderbird. You're using the same protocols, but uh, you know, it, it's just they could come on you for a terms of service violation as, as you said. Now the new threat, and uh, I say new, this actually um, it's a cycle. This, this was the way they used to do it um, back in the, in the 90s. This was more common, and then it faded out in favor of direct to MX sending. But they uh, are relaying through the uh, Microsoft mail user agents. Usually Outlook, Outlook Express, uh, Windows Mail, or whatever they call it. I don't know. But um, 
These I call the enemy within. This is when you have, as a, as a mail server administrator, if you've got these Windows users and they get infected, you have a big problem. It's happening on phones now too. Right? It's happening on phones now too. I have personally yes. seen clients' phones get rootkitted and next thing you know they're leaking IMAP credentials and relaying out through their... Okay, phones getting rootkitted and relaying IMAP credentials. You know what kind of phones those are? Uh, I've seen it on Android and iPhone, both more commonly Android. Android and iPhone, more commonly the Android. <sighs> okay, with direct to MX ratware, who has the problem? The um, originating site does have a problem. They're spewing out spam from their host. They, they are likely to get blacklisted. In fact, that's what um, many uh, of the uh, blacklists exist to do, is to focus on um, these um, zombies that are currently relaying outbound. Um, but it's not a big problem for the originating, originating site usually. All they need to do is block their port 25 outbound like most ISPs are doing already. Um, I've had this happen at a small business site I worked at in uh, Dallas, Texas, that um, uh, suddenly one day we wake up and find out that uh, our users are getting rejection notices that they're not, their mail isn't going out. Oops, I forgot to block port 25 on the firewall. Okay, I fixed that. I fixed that, and two days later, we were pretty much off all the, the blacklist. Um, users of remote mail services should be using the submission port 587. Like, um, there's no way you can connect to Gmail on port 25 for most ISPs. You need to be using 587 and you shouldn't have any problem. Now, you're going to have to authenticate there. You're not going to be able to, they're not going to take uh, direct to MX spam that way. It's not, they're not going to take mail to Gmail users, but they're going to take mail from Gmail users. Um, the next thing you're going to have to do when you've got this um, direct to MX ratware at your site is you just clean up your viruses. Uh, as I mentioned, the site in Dallas, I just, um, I blocked 25 out and I set the firewall to log hits from it and soon enough we had a list of about five IP addresses inside that were uh, the problem. We went and uh, applied the LART to the uh, users and everything was fine. Um, as I mentioned before too, the receiving side isn't going to have any big problems with this because um, of the uh, DNS block lists that are very effective at detecting these. Um, Spam House Zen list includes the uh, uh, CBL, the um, composite block list. It, um, which is going to list all these. The Barracuda, BRBL is the Barracuda Reputation blacklist, which is compiled by uh, Barracuda um, devices that they sell. Um, they have created lots of problems with those devices, but now they're giving something back with a good um, usable uh, DNS blacklist. Now, um, behavioral problem detection it refers to the fact that a spam zombie is not like a real mail transfer agent. It is not going to behave as well in, uh, in speaking the SMTP protocol to your server. The ways you can trip them up include the gray listing, which is where um, uh, mm -hmm. an unknown client connects. You simply give it a temporary failure. Try again later.
And then when they try again later, you'll let them through because you've seen them before. Most, many of these uh, direct MX zombies did not try again. I don't recommend gray listing these days, but uh, it, uh, it was effective in its day, and it still does trip up a lot of them. One thing you can get from gray listing is you give the DNS block list a little more time to uh, detect it, and oftentimes in a half hour's time, they're going to know. Greet pause. Um, is uh, uh, according to the SMTP protocol, the server gives a, a banner greeting to the client. The client is not allowed to speak before that it sees that banner. Many of these zombies are not even capable of seeing the banner. They're just one-way communication, and they're just going to try to spew it out as quickly as they can. Um, they may have built in delays, or they may not, but we see this regularly in the logs, is that some zombie has uh, spoken out of turn. That's what it amounts to. If they speak out of turn, we know they're a zombie. Real mail servers don't do this. I, I find on the vast majority of those, by the way, that they're already listed in the blacklist. Um, MX priority violations. A lot of people, um, a lot of sites will use different priority levels of their mail exchanger. The uh, protocol says you're supposed to go to the lowest numbered priority. But spammers got the idea a long time ago, hmm, maybe these higher priority ones, they're probably just a backup and they don't really do the same sort of spam uh, control that the, um, the lower, the, the main MX is going to do. That still works. A lot, a lot of sites you're going to get through by going to that secondary MX. And this is something I also see on IRC all the time and tell people, you don't want a secondary MX. It is what we call a spam magnet. It doesn't work. Now, mine, I use, uh, and I don't have this on the slides, but um, I'm going to give you a link uh, to my uh, post screen configuration. But mine, I have two IP addresses on the domains I host, and I have one of them, dot .211 is the primary, and dot .214 is the secondary. Post screen will detect if the connection comes to the secondary before it has seen you before. If you hit the secondary, it's not going to consider you a candidate for whitelisting. It's going to just tell you to come back later. All right. This is about dealing with the direct MX ratware, and it's, as I said, it's pretty easy to do. Port 25 is being blocked by most uh, m increasing number of end user ISPs. The um, IP reputation of the connecting client is, is pretty easy to determine. The uh, spam house uh, PBL is the policy block list. And um, ISPs are going to submit uh, whole large net blocks to them that they say should not be sending mail. Most ISPs and even, even some hosters, I don't know if like uh, Linode does this. Do we have any Linode people in here? Um, Andrew, you might know. You don't know. But uh, a lot of the um, these sites, uh, co-location sites and uh, uh, VPS providers are going to have their IP space in the policy block list, which means it doesn't really mean that you can't send mail from there. But it means that you're going to have to go to the trouble to set it up right. You, you've, got to, you've got to get your reverse DNS set up. You've got to go to Spam House um, website. You've got to submit your information to them. And they're going to check it out. And they'll remove you from the PBL. And then you'll be able to send mail. Um, the detected spew, uh, the CBL, as I mentioned before. Go ahead. 
it, um, they have, uh, does this get propagated with a DNS list? He says, propagation is not a real DNS term. Um, it, it, right, it, yes, it is distributed. They have, um, um, I don't know, I think it's about 13 or maybe more NS hosts worldwide. And actually, it's probably much more than that because I think each of their NS records has multiple IP addresses. Spam House is probably one of the biggest in the world in terms of uh, the DNS queries that they get. And uh, well, the reason I ask is, is, say somebody has a mail server and they want to blacklist somebody, is there a threshold of the number of people blacklisting something before it gets to that? Or do you report it directly? Um, Does that make sense? Is there a threshold of, um, are, you, are you asking how Spam House determines? Yeah, how, yeah, how does that work? Right. They are very tight-lipped about how they determine this. I have figured out a few things that uh, I know that if, uh, if you have a legitimate mail server using a non-fully qualified domain name as your hello value, if, if anybody's familiar with SMTP, that's what the client says. The client says, hello, I'm, this is my host name. Um, if that host name is not fully qualified, if, in other words, like, my host name is harrier.slackbuilds.org. If it was just to say, hello, Harrier, no, that's not going to work. It has to say, hello, harrier.slackbuilds.org. And that, was, that is one of the criteria that um, uh, CBL uses to detect. Uh, they also, but, but more, more than that, they've got thousands of spam trap addresses throughout many domains in the world. And these are highly secret. Nobody is supposed to know these addresses. They end up, they get published on web pages and Usenet, and they get harvested by the, by the uh, address harvesting bots. And uh, soon enough, they're going to be getting spam, and uh, and the client that is sending it gets listed. Reverse DNS is another uh, uh, tactic we can use against the direct MX ratware because some of them have uh, no pointer value set at all. Um, many of them are, are going to have a dynamic looking one like, um, oh, I don't know, I can't think of a good example, but dot res dot uh, uh, rr dot com and it's going to have pieces of the well, what Charter does is it takes the public IP yes and it dots and then do the HTTP dot city dots yeah. and, right. and then dot Charter dot something yeah the IP address itself or portions of it and dot um, city dot state or whatever, whatever each ISP has their own ways of doing this. But you can tell at a glance that uh, hey, that's a that's an end user IP address. That's not a custom pointer for a, a mail server. And a lot of time now, this uh, pointer in a mismatch. This is uh, not really a, a safe way to block spam, but it's, it is very, it's effective. It's going to take out a lot of non-spam, but um, a lot of sites don't have what we call fully or forward confirmed reverse DNS. So when they get the, you get the pointer value when you look up the IP address in the reverse DNS, you're going to look up, the, the mail server is going to look up the uh, that host name also, and ideally, that IP address is going to be one of the ones returned for that host name. If not, there's a mismatch, and that could be um, a reason that more aggressive sites could uh, use to block. Like I said, you're going to lose some real mail doing that, but it is effective. Um, and as I mentioned before, the behavior the misimplementation of standards that these zombies have to do. It's a big challenge to these um, programmers of the ratware 
to get something that is going to be small enough to uh, hopefully not get detected right away and uh, not get in the user's way too badly, although they don't really care much about that because they know they have a limited time in their window of opportunity, basically. Now we get to the subject of the talk is the relaying ratware, the enemy within. This is a sticky situation when you are the mail server administrator and one of your users has this stuff. The uh, denial of service. Now, some of you may have seen me around the convention and I've been packing heat. This is my squirt gun. Um, some of you may also know that in my spare time I'm a volunteer firefighter and I get to drive the great big pumper truck. Lots of fun. Those two devices serve the same basic purpose, do they not? It is to deliver a stream of water at a target. Okay. This is Aunt Betty sending you an email. My fire truck is what this ratware is going to do. And it literally is going to pump out as much as it can, as fast as it can. They know they've got a very small window of opportunity and they're going to take advantage of that. They're going to, they know that you are a legitimate mail server. They've got some real credentials that they're being able to use to relay and uh, remote sites are likely to accept that mail at least at first before they have detected that that is a spam source. So you're going to get a denial of service simply by your your pipe is going to be saturated. You're going to get more denial of service because you very quickly become listed and you find that when you have legitimate mail to send, nobody wants it. You're going to get everything rejected. <clears throat> Both sites have the problem with relaying ratware. As I said, the originating site is going to get blacklisted and the fixes are not easy. You've got to block that, uh, that sender. You've got to revoke those credentials. You've got to um, uh, stop your spew going out. You've got to get yourself off those blacklists, which in the case of uh, CBL and Barracuda, it's probably going to take a day or two. I don't know exactly. They don't want to tell you these details. Within an hour or two, typically now. An hour or two. Okay, but no, I didn't know that. If you're still spewing, you'll get relisted again immediately, and they won't let you get delisted so quickly. Right. If you're still spewing, you're going to get relisted with more uh, stringent uh, requirements to get off the list. Go ahead. Um, last year I was working with a small engineering firm, and uh, really there's no excuse for you to be spewing out spam out of your network. I mean, it's simple, just block. You know, the only thing allowed to send email outbound is, is your spam filter. Mm -hmm. And have all outgoing email go through it. I was using SonicWall, and I kept my users at If a user sent more than 200 messages, Okay. There's no excuse. Exactly. And, um, uh, rather than repeat all that, I'm just going to say you're getting ahead <laughs> of me here. But yes, you're right. You're right. There's no excuse to be spewing this out. It's, it's, there are things you can do, and we're going to cover that here momentarily. Thanks for coming, Bob. We'll see you. Um, okay. Now the receiving site has a different set of challenges also. The DNS block lists are not going to help you at first. And uh, suppose that um, you're using DNS whitelist also, which is something that uh, is also growing in use. You're going to cancel out these DNS BL hits with your, uh, with your whitelist. Uh, the behavior problem detection 
you're not going to have your uh, your early talker. You're not going to have your uh, um, um, I'm trying to think of those other. Well, anyway, the the the, the uh, protocol violations that many of these zombies do are just not going to happen because this is a real MTA. This is well-written software running on a real internet host. So anyway, in the first hour or two, a lot of this is going to end up in some users' inboxes. So you're going to have unhappy users as the receiving site. How do we mitigate this? Um, this is what you were talking about here is, is how you mitigate this at the sending, the originating site. First step, and uh, this is really very important. A lot of uh, hobbyist sites probably don't do this, but, uh, but you should. Uh, you need to separate your MX stream, the inbound from other sites across the world from your submission stream, which is your users. Um, they have different filtering requirements. You're going to have to do, you, you can't apply uh, things like non-fully qualified hello checks against your users because, well, a lot of these uh, uh, male user agents might not do that. They might not do that right. You have to, um, require authentication from your users. What this is going to do is help you a lot in pinpointing where your problem is. You've got to know if you're just uh, allowing relay from an IP range, which many sites still do, you don't know. It's going to be harder for you to identify the user with the problem. It's going to be harder to get them disconnected and shut off. Rate limiting is what you were mentioning. Um, you said 200 per hour is what you use. And so I had business users that occasionally would send a, med, send a single message to 20 recipients and then get that message back and hit reply all. So I felt like 20, or I felt like 200 in an hour was a good cap. 200 an hour is probably difficult for most humans to reach, really. Um, if you if you send a, a reply in your uh, Thunderbird to, uh, if you hit reply all, that's going to be a single email. The Sonic will, the Sonic will count at each recipient. Oh, it counts each recipient. Mail, so okay. If I had email going to 20 recipients, one mm -hmm. message, it would count as 20 messages. Okay. He's rate limiting at the firewall, not the MTA. Right. Rate limiting at the firewall, not the MTA. Um, did I get this thing plugged in? I don't think it's, uh, I'm afraid I'm running low on battery there. It says it's plugged in. Ah, that's the problem right there. Sorry. Okay. Well, I better get this done before the battery dies. <laughs> um, content filtering. Now, there's different requirements of content filtering. Um, what you're going to get from outside versus what you're going to send out. When you, um, the stuff that comes in from outside, you're going to be able to look at your received headers and determine which ones look like forgeries, for one thing. You're going to be able to, um, well, there's numerous more tools you can use. I'm not really familiar with that, uh, the, the content side of things. But I do know that on the, um, on the submission stuff, what you want to look at is a URI BL, the, the, the URI block list. Most spam is going to have an HTTP link in it that they want the victim to click. You can look that up and uh, that will um, um, that will be listed in one of these URI block lists. That's a real effective way of detecting that this is spam coming from your user. And bottom line, this is going to go over well at a Linux conference to discourage use of Microsoft MUAs. Well, as 
as has been pointed out, we were having problems with Android devices now too, and iPhones. So that's not going to be a silver bullet, but uh, it doesn't hurt. Um, if you can promote Thunderbird, Thunderbird behaves pretty well under most operating systems, and that's going to be a lot less vulnerable to uh, compromise. You know, I think I got ahead of myself. I went over these later slides. Uh, I said we need to separate the MX mail from submission. Uh, you support 587 is going to get around the firewall blocking that these ISPs are doing. Now, some people are going to have, like an ISP, suppose you're an ISP and you've got, uh, you did it wrong 20 years ago and you've got users that are on port 25 and it's going to be a big political issue to get them off it. It's not hard to separate your stream anyway because all you have to do is put them on a different IP address. They don't, that doesn't need, the, the, the name that your users are using does not need to be the same as your MX host name. Okay. When you require authentication for your users to send mail, it makes it slightly more difficult for the, um, for the ratware. This is why what uh, a lot of it does is they've got an API that uh, uh, controls the outlook from uh, behind the scenes. And they're going to be able to, um, they're still going to be able to send mail just as the user does. But some of it might not do that quite right, so it doesn't hurt. And as I pointed out, you're going to be able to identify the affected user much more quickly and accurately. And easier to put a stop to the spew that you're going to be sending. Now on to rate limiting. How much does a typical user send? Well, um, it's pretty hard to, to type out. Even if you're going through an inbox and forwarding everything to a whole bunch of people, it's really hard for a limit like 200 an hour to be reached by a human user. What I say, you um, shoot first and ask questions later. You're going to just tell your users that you're limited to 200 or you don't even have to tell them what the exact limit is. Just say that if you exceed what we consider a normal usage, you're going to find that your account is suspended. Now, they, they, maybe they're not sending spam, but it's not likely. If they're going to be hitting something like 200 an hour, they are likely a spam zombie. And you check it out. That's, what, that's when you read the logs and find out what's going on. Um, I'm a Postfix user myself, and these are the um, rate limiting tools that we have available. Um, now, uh, you mentioned a firewall, sonic wall. Now, this is not something that, that I've messed with, but I'm going to look into that. Well, there was no firewall. It was the spam filter. Okay. Okay, spam filter in front of the mail server. Um, there's a milter limit, which uh, these are, uh, milters are uh, from SendMail originally, but Postfix has added uh, support for those. Um, and then Postfix has its own policy protocol. And I, I listed three uh, policy services that are available. Um, Post FWD, I believe, stands for Firewall Demon, which uh, postfwd.org. That's written in Python, and uh, it's able to do various intelligent things, and it's fairly simple to figure out. You just, uh, you just give it criteria. Uh, if the authentication user has been seen more than 200 times an hour, you, it, it will refuse the mail from that user. Policy D is, there's two versions of that. 
and uh, I think the original was in pearl, and I think the, the replacement is in C. Um, that's not one I've used, but it's, it's also able to do these type of uh, um, decisions. Now, SQL Gray is actually a gray listing demon, and I'm not sure. Oh, yes, it does do rate limiting also. That's why I put it up there, because um, th uh, throttling is the feature they call it. But SQL Gray uh, exists for gray listing, but it, uh, they have added that on. I'm going to quickly go over some um, uh, do's and don'ts of content filtering um, for uh, mail from your users. You, one thing you definitely want to do, as I mentioned, is the URIBL test. Another thing is you can look at the content, and um, Spam Assassin guys have spent way too many hours reading all this junk and trying to find patterns, uh, signs that indicate that uh, this content is spam. What you don't want to do is look at the received headers and apply DNSBL tests to that. Your user is uh, submitting from, uh, say they're in a, uh, a hotel. A lot of these hotels get uh, their wireless access listed on these uh, block lists, but they don't block 25 because uh, they've got uh, high paying customers that they want to be able to reach the internet. Well, if you're looking at the received headers from places like that, it's going to, um, it's going to be meaningless and you can actually block real mail that way. Um, white listing is not a good idea. Your sender addresses are, um, this is what the ratware is going to use. It, says, it, it knows the real sender address to use that's what it's going to do. And um, known good clients could be hit by that. Now we're going to quickly go over the content filtering tools that uh, are available for PostFix. And, and uh, there's others. There's, as I said, Milters for SendMail uh, are uh, supported. But um, these are the tools that, that I use and recommend. Mavis D. New is a, uh, a pearl based uh, uh, content filtering framework. It's not actually a content filter, but uh, it invokes the uh, Spam Assassin um, pearl modules within the same Mavis process, Mavis D. Uh, Spam Assassin, which is an Apache uh, uh, project. That blue on blue didn't work out too well, did it? <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Spam Assassin is the brains of the um, content filtering of a Mavis D. New, and, and you can also use uh, antiviruses like uh, Clam AV. In my own experience, I have not gotten much from Clam AV, but it's free software. It's good stuff. It, it's worth having. You're going to catch a few. It's not worth having. Clam used to be good, but at this point, it is far more likely to actually break your filtering process because they deliberately broke the binary once you get new updates. You didn't update I remember version. that. Yes, he, he points out that, that uh, Clam did... Uh, is that every version upgrade they it's have? Not, no, it's just whenever they get a wild error up their butt. Yes, uh, I know they've done that before, and that was pretty irresponsible, but they had uh, a version where they uh, didn't maintain backward compatibility, and if you uh, weren't paying close attention, uh, it was the, the database update, wasn't it? Yeah. That didn't work with the older version of the it, software. It's not just that it didn't work, they deliberately they, crafted it. The they deliberately crafted it to crash the older binary. And at least as importantly, um, when I finally just, that was the last straw for me because I looked at my stats for the last two years and 
Clam, I was running Clam behind Spam Assassin in the chain, and Clam had caught a whopping two males in that time. Two males because after Spam, Spam Assassin. Spam gets the vast majority yes. of the males anyway. Yes, I, I had similar experiences uh, to you that, yeah, now I was running Clam in front of, uh, Amavis D new runs, uh, it considers the virus uh, a higher priority to block, but I wasn't finding as much. What was blocking the viruses was my post screen, uh, my uh, MTA filtering. They just weren't getting to a Mavis D. And uh, yeah, I, I agree. It, it's it's uh, it was the Maytag repairman sitting around doing nothing back when uh, when I was running that. But uh, okay, I'll uh, I'll rethink that for next year if I'm going to do the same boring presentation again. <laughs> Okay, now if you get caught unprepared by all this, what are you going to do? Um, well, the first step to do, and pointy head bosses don't like this, but you got to do it. Stop your MTA. Do not send your junk out. Everything in your queue has been rejected by legitimate mail servers all over the world, you must stop the abuse. If you don't, you're not getting mail out anyway, so what's the point? Stop it. Those logs are going screaming by faster than anyone can possibly read them. You just can't, you've got to, to get the abuse stopped right away. The way SMTP works is you're going to find your legitimate sites are going to queue the mail that they have coming to you, so you're not likely to lose much, if anything, at all if you can get it back running uh, soon. Another thing you can do relatively safely is to just stop the outbound sending. Just turn off your. Uh, um, SMTP client in your MTA. In PostFix, um, there a, a means of doing that would be uh, um, oh, defer transports. But there's other ways you can do it. If you want to do the quick and dirty thing, you can just block your port 25 going out. Uh, that is uh, connections to port 25 from your server. That works too. But like I said, your logs are going to be screaming by, and it's a whole lot easier if you can just get it stopped for a little while. You're going to have to get those logs to where you can identify the offending user. If you're logging who authenticated, this will be real easy to do. You disable that account, and then you go to that user. Assuming that you're the one responsible for their MTA, you remove their uh, ratware from their machine or phone, as the case may be. Next thing you're going to need to do, well, not necessarily in order, but you're going to have to identify and delete or hold the, the spams that are in the queue. They're all going to be from the same user, most likely. Um, not necessarily, though. You're going to have to look at what's in your queue, and it's, it's a big job. Before you restart your um, outbound sending, before you restart your MTA, you're going to have to look at these um, uh, spam lists and see if you're still on it, because if you are, what's the point? Um, spam House Zen is used by a large number of sites worldwide, and, and you're not going to get um, much mail out if you're on it. Then for a while after that, you're going to have to just keep on top of things and watch logs for uh, other rejections you can get. What if you've been added to private block lists somewhere? Some people will do that. Some small, usually smaller and more aggressive sites, but sometimes bigger sites are going to have automated ways of detecting this, and they're going to blacklist you there. You got to set up the mitigation strategies that we discussed. That's your last step. 
Um, and the other step is to contact Rob Zero, and I'll help you with this, but it won't be cheap. <laughs> All right, we have completed, and I think everybody survived without pillows. Um, are there any questions? Any uh, tomato, rotten tomatoes? Yes, sir? So, a question about your thoughts on male politics. So, we're a university, you know, 60 to 70% of people are male forwarding. Yes, uh, male forwarding. Uh, <laughs> what are my thoughts on male forwarding? My thoughts are you can't get away with that in 2013. Um, people, he says that they're at an EDU and they've got um, users that want to get all their mail in their Gmail mailbox. Here's what's going to happen. You're going you're gonna to relay spam. You're going you're gonna to get spam for that address. Even if you're doing really good um, spam avoidance, nothing is going to be perfect. You're going to relay some spam to Gmail. Um, and Gmail is going to say, you're the spammer. It's difficult to get away with that these days. Um, you could, I suppose, encapsulate, um, you know, resubmit it as your own local sender, in, in like a mime attached the message to, uh, um, and resubmit it through your own send mail in a dot forward file. It depends what kind of uh, uh, delivery agent you're using and whether you're going to be able to do that very easily. But no, these days that's very difficult. Same envelope forwarding is going to break uh, DKIM. It's going to break SPF that a lot of people are, uh, are using to uh, determine uh, spam. Are you, are you worried about Gmail, the Gmail interface being compromised and sending spam out from your addresses? Or are you worried about getting blacklisted by Gmail? Yeah, right. Um, that's true. I mean, if you, you could, what you could do is just apply a whole lot more aggressive spam filtering to these mails that you're going to forward. You're going to have to say that some false positives are acceptable. And, and then you could possibly be reasonably safe. You're going to have a few that uh, are going to get through, but um, you can work on develop you can have an automated way of detecting that, uh, oh, I've got something that's being rejected. I need to take some action on that. And you can suspend, you can set something up that's going to hold these suspicious mails. And so you're not going to keep bombarding them with the same content over and over again. But yeah. Anything else? I just want to point out, um, there's just because I've run into this, it's been a giant pain in the butt. If you do end up with an issue and you get blacklisted with SPU, um, one of my common tools is go to antiabuse.org for the multi-RBL check. There is a new-ish a new -ish RBL that showed up that is not there. It doesn't show up on the multi-RBL check. It's called the mail spike. Mail spike. And they are really annoying because they do not honor D-list requests. Okay. Mail, you, you mentioned the mail spike not being on the uh, multi-RBL checker that you use, yeah. which is... Uh, Antiabuse.org. Antiabuse.org. There are numerous uh, of the multi RBL checkers out there. Um, and yes, uh, Mail Spike is actually not a bad list. I, I recently started using that in my post screen at a low priority. Low priority, fun. Mm -hmm. There's some ISPs out there using them as a one hit kill. Mm -hmm. Oh, and no. Again, they are not honoring the list requests. Um, that's something I want to mention too. Um, some of you might be interested in, I've got my, uh, had my web address on that first page up there. I don't know how to get back to the, um, I have my post screen configuration up there at, at uh, uh, robzero.nodns for us slant post screen and that's my current active uh, post screen configuration which, which I'm using to block the spam. Some of you might find that of interest. Anything else? I thank you all for coming. I hope I didn't bore you too badly. And uh, we're done.
Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources, and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out, and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail, and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago, uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Well, stack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack, they were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch. 
where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. And then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and the administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on asterisks. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Asterisk based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, 
uniquely designed to complement any asterisk or switch fox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again.